The Duelist by Bram Stoker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. The Duelists by Bram Stoker. Bis dat ki non sito dat. There was joy in the house of Bub. For ten long years had Ephraim and Sophonisba Bub mourned in vain the loneliness of their life. Unavailingly had they gazed into the emporia of baby linen and fixed their searching glances on the basket makers, warehouses, where the cradles hung in tempting rows. In vain had they prayed and sighed and groaned, and wished and waited and wept, but never had even a ray of hope been held out by the family physician. But now at last the wished-for moment had arrived. Month after month had flown by on leaden wings, and the destined days had slowly measured their course. The months had become weeks. The weeks had dwindled down to days. The days had been attenuated to hours. The hours had lapsed into minutes. The minutes had slowly died away. And but seconds remained. Ephraim Bub sat cowering on the stairs and tried with high-strung ears to catch the strain of blissful music from the lips of his firstborn. There was silence in the house, silence as of the deadly calm before the cyclone. Ah, Ephraim Bub, little thinkest thou that another moment may forever destroy the peaceful, happy course of thy life, and open to thy too craving eyes the portals of that wondrous land where childhood reigns supreme, and where the tyrant infant, with the wave of his tiny hand and the imperious treble of his tiny voice, sentences his parent to the deadly vault beneath the castle moat. As the thought strikes thee, thou becomest pale. How thou tremblest as thou findest thyself upon the brink of the abyss! Wouldst that thou could recall the past! But hark! The die is cast for good or ill. The long years of praying and hoping have found an end at last. From the chamber within comes a sharp cry, which shortly after is repeated. Ah! Ephraim! That cry is the feeble effort of childish lips as yet unused to the rough worldly form of speech to frame the word Father. In the glow of thy transport all doubts are forgotten. And when the doctor cometh forth as the harbinger of joy, he findeth thee radiant with newfound delight. My dear sir, allow me to congratulate you to offer twofold felicitations. Mr. Bubsha, you are the father of twins. Halcyon days. The twins were the finest children that were ever seen, so at least said the cognoscenti, and the parents were not slow to believe. The nurse's opinion was in itself a proof. It was not, ma'am, that they were fine for twins, but they were fine for singles, and she had ought to know, for she had nussed a many in her time, both twins and singles. All they wanted was to have their dear little legs cut off and little wings on their dear little shoulders, for to be put one on each side of a white marble tombstone, cut beautiful, sacred to the relic of Ephraim Bub that they might, sir, if so be that Mrs. was to survive the father of two such lovely twins, although she would make bold to say, and no offence intended, that a handsome gentleman, though a trifle or two older than his good lady, though for the matter of that she heard the gentleman was never too old at all, and for her own part she liked them the better for it, not like bits of boys that didn't know their own minds, that a gentleman was the father of two such heavenly twins, God bless them, couldn't be called anything but a boy, though for the matter of that she never knowed in her experience which it was much as had such twins, or any twins at all, so much for the matter of that. The twins were the idols of their parents, and at the same time their pleasure and their pain. Did Zerubbabel cough? Ephraim would start from his balmy slumbers with an agonized cry of consternation, for visions of innumerable twins black in the face from croup haunted his nightly pillow. Did Zachariah rail at ethereal expansion? Sophonisba, with pallid hue and dishevelled locks, would fly to the cradle of her offspring, 
Did pins torture or strings afflict, or flannel or flies tickle, or light dazzle, or darkness affright, or hunger or thirst assail the synchronous productions? The household of Bub would be roused from quiet slumbers, or the current of its manifold workings changed. The twins grew apace, were weaned, teethed, and at length arrived at the stage of three years. They grew in beauty, side by side. They filled one home, etc. Rumors of War Harry Murford and Tommy Santon lived in the same range of villas as Ephraim Bubb. Harry's parents had taken up their abode in number 25. Number 27 was happy in the perpetual sunshine of Tommy's smiles. And between these two residences, Ephraim Bubb reared his blossoms, the number of his mansion being 26. Harry and Tommy had been accustomed from the earliest times to meet each other daily. Their primal method of communication had been by the housetops, till their respective sires had been obliged to pay compensation to Bub for damages to his roof and dormer windows, and from that time they had been forbidden by the home authorities to meet, whilst their mutual neighbour had taken the precaution of having his garden walls pebble-dashed and topped with broken glass to prevent their incursions. Harry and Tommy, however, being gifted with daring souls, lofty, ambitious, impetuous natures, and strong seats to their trousers, defied the rugged walls of Bub and continued to meet in secret. Compared with these two youths, Castor and Pollux, Damon and Pythias, Eloisa and Abelard, are but tame examples of duality or constancy and friendship. All the poets from Hyginus to Scylla might sing of noble deeds and desperate dangers held as not for friendship's sake but they would have been mute had they but known of the mutual affection of Harry and Tommy. Day by day, and often night by night, would these two brave the perils of nurse and father and mother, of whip and imprisonment and hunger and thirst and solitude and darkness to meet together. What they discussed in secret none other knew. What deeds of darkness were perpetrated in their symposia none could tell. Alone they met, alone they remained, and alone they departed to their several abodes. There was in the garden of Bub a summer house overgrown with trailing plants, and surrounded by young poplars which the fond father had planted on his children's natal day, and whose rapid growth he had proudly watched. These trees quite obscured the summer house, and here Harry and Tommy, knowing after a careful observation that none ever entered the place, held their conclaves. Time after time they met in full security and followed their customary pursuit of pleasure. Let us raise the mysterious veil and see what was the great unknown at whose shrine they bent the knee. Harry and Tommy had each given as a Christmas box a new knife, and for a long time, nearly a year, these knives, similar in size and pattern, were their chief delights. With them they cut and hacked in their respective homes all things which would not be likely to be noticed, for the young gentlemen were wary and had no wish that their moments of pleasure should be atoned for by moments of pain. The insides of drawers and desks and boxes, the underparts of tables and chairs, the backs of picture frames, even the floors, where corners of the carpets could surreptitiously be turned up, all bore marks of their craftsmanship and to compare notes on these artistic triumphs was a source of joy. At length, however, a critical time came. Some new field of action should be opened up, for the old appetites were sated, and the old joys had begun to pall. It was absolutely necessary that the existing schemes of destruction should be enlarged, and yet this could hardly be done without a terrible risk of discovery, for the limits of safety had long since been reached and passed. But, be the risk great or small, some new ground should be broken, some new joy found, for the old earth was barren, and the craving for pleasure was growing fiercer with each successive day. Crisis had come. Who could tell the issue? The tucket sounds. They met in the arbour, determined to discuss this grave question. The heart of each was big with revolution. The head of each was full of scheme and strategy, and the pocket of each was full of sweet stuff, the sweeter for being stolen. After having dispatched the sweets, 
the conspirators proceeded to explain their respective views with regard to the enlargement of their artistic operations. Tommy unfolded with much pride a scheme which he had in contemplation of cutting a series of holes in the sounding boards of the piano so as to destroy its musical properties. Harry was in no wise behindhand in his ideas of reform. He had conceived the project of cutting the canvas at the back of his great-grandfather's portrait, which his father held in high regard among his lairs and pennants, so that in time, when the picture should be removed, the skin of paint would be broken, the head fall bodily out from the frame. At this point of the council a brilliant thought occurred to Tommy. Why should not the enjoyment be doubled, and the musical instruments and family pictures of both establishments be sacrificed on the altar of pleasure? This was agreed to Nem Con, and then the meeting adjourned for dinner. When they next met it was evident that there was a screw loose somewhere, that there was something rotten in the state of Denmark. After a little fencing on both sides, it came out that the schemes of domestic reform had been foiled by maternal vigilance, and that so sharp had been the reprimand consequent on a partial discovery of the schemes that they would have to be abandoned, till such time, at least, as increased physical strength would allow the reformers to laugh to scorn parental threats and injunctions. Sadly, the two forlorn youths took out their knives and regarded them. Sadly, sadly, they thought, as erst did Othello, of all the fair chances of honour and triumph and glory gone for ever. They compared knives with the almost the fondness of doting parents. There they were, so equal in size and strength and beauty, dimmed by no corrosive rust, tarnished by no stain, and with unbroken edges of the keenness of Saladin's sword. So like were the knives that, but for the initials scratched in the handles, neither boy could have been sure which was his own. After a while they began mutually to brag of the superior excellence of their respective weapons. Tommy insisted that his was the sharper. Harry asserted that his was the stronger of the two. Hotter and hotter grew the war of words. The tempers of Harry and Tommy got inflamed, and their boyish bosoms glowed with manly thoughts of daring and hate. But there was abroad in that hour a spirit of a bygone age, one that penetrated even to that dim arbour in the grove of Bub. The world-old scheme of ordeal was whispered by the spirit in the ear of each, and suddenly the tumult was allayed. With one impulse the boys suggested that they should test the quality of their knives by the ordeal of the hack. No sooner said than done. Harry held out his knife edge uppermost, and Tommy, grasping his firmly by the handle, brought down the edge of the blade crosswise on Harry's. The process was then reversed, and Harry became in turn the aggressor. Then they paused and eagerly looked for the result. It was not hard to see. In each knife were two great dents of equal depth, and so it was necessary to renew the contest and seek further proof. What needs it to relate seriatim the details of that direful strife? The sun had long since gone down, and the moon, with fair smiling face, had long risen over the roof of Bub, where, wearied and jaded, Harry and Tommy sought their respective homes. Alas, the splendour of the knives was gone for ever. Ichabod, Ichabod, the glory had departed and not remained but two useless wrecks, with keen edges destroyed and now like unto nothing save the serried hills of Spain. But though they mourned for their fondly cherished weapons, the hearts of the boys were glad, for the bygone day had opened to their gaze a prospect of pleasure as boundless as the limits of the world. The First Crusade From that day a new era dawned in the lives of Harry and Tommy. So long as the resources of the parental establishments could hold out, so long would their new amusement continue. Subtly they obtained surreptitious possession of articles of family cutlery, not in general use, and brought them one by one to their rendezvous. These came fair and spotless from the sanctity of the butler's pantry. Alas, they returned not as they came. But in course of time the stock of available cutlery became exhausted, and again the inventive faculties of the youths were called into requisition. They reasoned thus. 
The knife game, it is true, is played out. But the excitement of the hack is not to be dispensed with. Let us carry, then, this great idea into new worlds. Let us still live in the sunshine of pleasure. Let us continue to hack, but with objects other than knives. It was done. Not knives now engaged the attention of the ambitious youths. Spoons and forks were daily flattened and beaten out of shape. Pepper Castor met Pepper Castor in combat, and both were born dying from the field. Candlesticks met in fray to part no more on this side of the grave. Even epigonies were used as weapons in the crusade of hack. At last all the resources of the butler's pantry became exhausted, and then began a system of miscellaneous destruction that proved in a little time ruinous to the furniture of the respective homes of Harry and Tommy. Mrs. Santon and Mrs. Murford began to notice that the wear and tear in their households became excessive. Day after day, some new domestic calamity seemed to have occurred. Today a valuable edition of some book whose luxurious binding made it an object for public display would appear to have suffered some dire misfortune, for the edges were frayed and broken, and the back loose if not altogether displaced. Tomorrow the same awful fate would seem to have followed some miniature frame, the day following, the legs of some chair or spider table would show signs of extraordinary hardship. Even in the nursery, the sounds of lamentation were heard. It was a thing of daily occurrence for the little girls to state that when going to bed at night, they had laid their dear dollies in their beds with tender care, but that when again seeking them in the period of recess, they had found them with all their beauty gone, with legs and arms amputated, and faces beaten from all semblance of human form. Then articles of crockery began to be missed. The thief could in no case be discovered, and the wages of the servants from constant stoppages began to be nominal rather than real. Mrs. Murford and Mrs. Santon moaned their losses, but Harry and Tommy gloated day after day over their spoils, which lay in an ever-increasing heap in the hidden grove of Bub. To such an extent had the fondness of the hack now grown, that with both youths it was an infatuation, a madness, frenzy. At length, one awful day arrived. The butlers of the houses of Murford and Santon, harassed by constant losses and complaints, and finding that their breakage account was in excess of their wages, determined to seek some sphere of occupation where, if they did not meet with suitable reward or recognition of their services, they would at least not lose whatever fortune and reputation they had already acquired. Accordingly, before rendering up their keys and the goods entrusted to their charge, they proceeded to take a preliminary stock of their own accounts, to make sure of their accredited accuracy. Dire indeed was their distress when they knew to the full the havoc which had been wrought, terrible their anguish of the present, bitter their thoughts of the future. Their hearts bowed down with weight of woe, failed them quite, reeled the strong brains that had erst overcome foes of deadlier spirit than grief, and felt their stalwart forms prone on the floor of their respective sancta sanctorum. Late in the day, when their services were required, they were sought for in bower and hail, and at length discovered where they lay. But alas for justice, they were accused of being drunk, and for having, whilst in their degraded condition, deliberately injured all the property on which they could lay hands, were not the evidences of their guilt patent to all in the hecatombs of the destroyed. Then they were charged with all the evils wrought in the houses, and on their indignant denial, Harry and Tommy, each in his own home, according to their concealed scheme of action, stepped forward and relieved their minds of the deadly weight that had for long in secret borne them down. The story of each ran that, time after time, he had seen the butler, when he thought that nobody was looking, knocking knives together in the pantry, chairs and books and pictures in the drawing-room and study, dolls in the nursery and plates in the kitchen. Then indeed was the master of each household stern and uncompromising in his demands for justice. Each butler was committed to the charge of myrmidians of the law, under the double charge of drunkenness and willful destruction of property. Softly and sweetly slept Harry and Tommy in their little beds that night. Angels seemed to whisper to them, for they smiled as though lost in pleasant dreams. 
The rewards given by proud and grateful parents lay in their pockets, and in their hearts the happy consciousness of having done their duty. Truly sweet should be the slumbers of the just. Let the dead past bury its dead. It might be supposed that now the operations of Harry and Tommy would be obliged to be abandoned. Not so, however. The minds of these youths were of no common order, nor were their souls, of such weak nature, as to yield at the first summons of necessity. Like Nelson, they knew not fear. Like Napoleon, they held impossible to be the adjective of fools, and they reveled in the glorious truth that in the lexicon of youth is no such word as fail. Therefore, on the day following the eclaircissement of the butler's misdeeds, they met in the arbour to plan a new campaign. In the hour when all seemed blackest to them, and when the narrowing walls of possibility hedged in on every side, thus ran the deliberations of these dauntless youths. We have played out the meaner things that are inanimate and inert. Why not then trench in the domains of life? The dead have lapsed into the regions of the forgotten past. Let the living look to themselves. That night they met when all the households had retired to balmy sleep, and not but the amorous wailings of nocturnal cats told of the existence of life and sentience. Each bore into the arbour in his arms a pet rabbit and a piece of sticking plaster. Then, in the peaceful, quiet moonlight, commenced a work of mystery, blood and gloom. The proceedings began by the fixing of a piece of sticking plaster over the mouth of each rabbit to prevent it making a noise, if so inclined. Then Tommy held up his rabbit by its scuffy tail, and it hung wriggling, a white mass in the moonlight. Slowly Harry raised his rabbit, holding it in the same manner, and when level with his head, brought it down on Tommy's client. But the chances had been miscalculated. The boys held firmly to the tails, but the chief portions of the rabbits fell to earth. Ere the doomed beasts could escape, however, the operators had pounced on them, and this time holding them by the hind legs, renewed the trial. Deep into the night the game was kept up, and the eastern sky began to show signs of approaching day, as each boy bore triumphantly the dead course of his favourite bunny and placed it within its sometime hutch. Next night the same game was renewed with a new rabbit on each side, and for more than a week, so long as the hutches supplied the wherewithal, the battle was sustained. True, that there were sad hearts and red eyes in the juveniles of Santon and Murford as one by one the beloved pets were found dead. But Harry and Tommy were the hearts of heroes, steeled to suffering and death to the pitiful cries of childhood, still fought the good fight on to the bitter end. When the supply of rabbits was exhausted, other munition was not wanting, and for some days the war was continued with white mice, dormice, hedgehogs, guinea pigs, pigeons, lambs, canaries, parakeets, linnets, squirrels, parrots, marmots, poodles, ravens, tortoises, terriers, and cats. Of these, as might be expected, the most difficult to manipulate were the terriers and the cats and of these two classes the proportion of the difficulties in the way of terrier hacking was, when compared with those of cat hacking, about that with the simple lack of the British pharmacopoeia bears to water in the compound which dairymen palm off upon a too confiding public is milk. More than once when engaged in the rapturous delights of cat hacking had Harry and Tommy wished that the silent tomb could open its ponderous and massy jaws and engulf them, for the feline victims were not patient in their death agonies, and often broke the bonds in which the security of the artists rested, and turned fiercely on their executioners. At last, however, all the animals available were sacrificed, but the passion for hacking still remained. How was it all to end? A cloud with golden lining. Tommy and Harry sat in the arbour dejected and disconsolate. They wept like two Alexanders, because there were no more worlds to conquer. At last the conviction had been forced upon them, that the resources available for hacking were exhausted. Very morning they had had a desperate battle, and their attire showed the ravages of direful war. Their hats were battered into shapeless masses, 
Their shoes were soleless and heelless, and had the uppers broken. The ends of their braces, their sleeves and their trousers were frayed, and had they indulged in the manly luxury of coat-tails, these two would have gone. Truly, hacking had become an absorbing passion with them. Long and fiercely had they been swept onwards on the wings of the demon of strife, and powerless at the best of times had been the promptings of good, but now heated with combat, maddened by the equal success of arms, and with the lust for victory still unsated, they longed more fiercely than ever for some new pleasure. Like tigers that have tasted blood, they thirsted for a larger and more potent libation. As they sat with their souls in a tumult of desire and despair, some evil genius guided into the garden the twin blossoms of the tree of Bub. Hand in hand, Zechariah and Zerubbabel advanced from the back door. They had escaped from their nurses, and with the exploring instinct of humanity advanced boldly into the great world, the terra incognita, the ultima tool of the paternal domain. In the course of time they approached the hedge of poplars, from behind which the anxious eyes of Harry and Tommy looked for their approach, for the boys knew that where the twins were, the nurses were accustomed to be gathered together, and they feared discovery if their retreat should be cut off. It was a touching sight. These lovely babies, alike in form, feature, size, expression, and dress. In fact, so like each other that one might not have told either from which. When the startling similarity was recognized by Harry and Tommy, each suddenly turned and, grasping the other by the shoulder, spoke in a keen whisper. Hack! They are exactly equal. This is the very apothesis of our art. With excited faces and trembling hands, they laid their plans to lure the unsuspecting babies within the precincts of their charnel house, and they were so successful in their efforts that in a little time the twins had toddled behind the hedge and were lost to the sight of the parental mansion. Harry and Tommy were not famed for gentleness within the immediate precincts of their respective homes, but it would have delighted the heart of any philanthropist to see the kindly manner in which they arranged for the pleasures of the helpless babies. With smiling faces and playful words and gentle wiles, they led them within the arbor, and then, under pretense of giving them some of the sudden jumps in which infants rejoice, they raised them from the ground. Tommy held Zachariah across his arm, with his baby moon face smiling up at the cobwebs on the arbor roof, and Harry, with a mighty effort, raised the cherubic Zerubbabel aloft. Each nerved himself for a great endeavor. Harry to give Tommy to endure a shock, and then the form of Zerubbabel was seen whirling through the air round Harry's glowing and determined face. There was a sickening crash, and the arm of Tommy yielded visibly. The pasty face of Zerubbabel had fallen fair on that of Zachariah, for Tommy and Harry were by this time artists of too great experience to miss so simple a mark. The puffy-like noses collapsed, the puffy-like cheeks became for a moment flattened, and when in an instant more they parted, the faces of both were dabbled in gore. Immediately the firmament was rent with a series of such yells as might have awakened the dead. Forthwith from the house of Bub came the echoes in parental cries and footsteps. As the sounds of scurrying feet rang through the mansion, Harry cried to Tommy, They will be on us soon. Let us cut to the roof of the stable and drop the ladder. Tommy answered by a nod, and the two boys, regardless of consequences and bearing each a twin, ascended to the roof of the stable by means of a ladder which usually stood against the wall and which they pulled up after them. As Ephraim Bub issued from his house in pursuit of his lost darlings, the sight which met his gaze froze his very soul. There on the coping of the stable roof stood Harry and Tommy renewing their game. They seemed like two young demons forcing some diabolical implement. For each in turn the, the twins were lifted high in the air and let fall with stunning force on the supine form of its fellow. How Ephraim felt! none but a tender and imaginative father can conceive. It would be enough to wring the heart of even a callous parent to see his children, the darlings of his old age, 
his own beloved twins being sacrificed to the brutal pleasure of unregenerate youths, without being made unconsciously and helplessly guilty of the crime of fratricide. Loudly did Ephraim and also Sophonispa, who with dishevelled locks had now appeared upon the scene, bewail their unhappy lot and shriek in vain for aid. But by rare ill chance no eyes save their own saw the work of butchery or heard the shrieks of anguish and despair. Wildly did Ephraim, mounting on the shoulders of his spouse, strive, but in vain to scale the stable wall. Baffled in every effort, he rushed into the house and appeared in a moment, bearing in his hands a double-barreled gun, into which he poured the contents of a shot pouch as he ran. He came anigh the stable, and hailed the murderous youths. Drop them, twins, and come down here, or I'll shoot you like a brace of dogs. Never! exclaimed the heroic two with one impulse, and continued their awful pastime with a zest tenfold as they knew that the agonized eyes of parents wept at the cause of their joy. Then die! shrieked Ephraim, as he fired both barrels, left right, at the hackers. But alas! Love for his darlings shook the hand that never shook before. As the smoke cleared off and Ephraim recovered from the kick of his gun, he heard a loud twofold laugh of triumph, and saw Harry and Tommy all unhurt, waving in the air the trunks of the twins. The fond father had blown the heads completely off his own offspring. Tommy and Harry shrieked aloud in glee, and after playing catch with the bodies for some time, seen only by the agonized eyes of the infanticide, and his wife flung them high in the air. Ephraim leaped forward to catch what had once been Zachariah, and Sophonisba grabbed wildly for the loved remains of her Zerubbabel. But the weight of the bodies and the height from which they fell were not reckoned by either parent. And from being ignorant of a simple dynamical formula, each tried to effect an object with calm common sense, united with scientific knowledge, would have told them was impossible. The masses fell, and Ephraim and Sophonisba were stricken dead by the falling twins, who were thus posthumously guilty of the crime of parasite. An intelligent coroner's jury found the parents guilty of the crimes of infanticide and suicide, on the evidence of Harry and Tommy, who swore reluctantly that the inhuman monsters maddened by drink had killed their offspring by shooting them in the air out of a cannon, since stolen, whence like curses they had fallen on their own heads and that they had slain themselves sui manibus with their own hands. Accordingly, Ephraim and Sophonisba were denied the solace of Christian burial, and were committed to the earth with maimed rites, and had stakes driven to their middles to pin them down in their unhallowed graves till the crack of doom. Harry and Tommy were rewarded with national honours, and were knighted even at their tender years. Fortune seemed to smile upon them, all the long after years, and they lived to a ripe old age, hale of body, and respected and beloved of all. Often in the golden summer eves, when all nature seemed at rest, when the oldest cask was open and the largest lamp was lit, when the chestnuts glowed in the embers and the kid turned on the spit, when their great-grandchildren pretended to mend a fictional armour and to trim an imaginary helmet's plume, when the shuttles of the good wives of their grandchildren went flashing each through its proper loom, with shouting and with laughter, they were accustomed to tell the tale of the duelists, or the death doom of the double-born. End of The Duelists by Bram Stoker Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama